Hello and thanks for having me today. Um, the title of my presentation is Managing Heart Failure. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Um, really, my objectives today first, I just want to briefly review the classification and staging of patients with heart failure. Um, review guideline directed medical therapy for treatment of heart failure, as well as discuss some of the new technologies that have been out on the market in the last year, um, particularly in remote heart failure surveillance, our cardiogram system, which is a pulmonary artery pressure monitor, as well as the new medications that are available for treatment of heart failure. As you all know, heart failure is very common. It affects over 5.1 million Americans each year, and the prevalence is expected to continue to rise in the future. There are more than 650,000 new cases of heart failure diagnosed each year, and it accounts for 1.1 million hospital admissions each year. The total cost of heart failure care in the United States is astounding, over $30 billion each year. Over half of that is in hospitalizations, and heart failure has the highest readmission rate of all adult inpatient groups. And as many of you know now with some of the Medicare reforms, um, there's actually a, a hospital readmission reduction program where hospitals that have an above national average 30-day heart failure um, hospital readmission rate can get penalized and percentage of their total Medicare um, payments can be withheld. Um, just a, briefly, a definition of heart failure is really a clinical syndrome that results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. Um, symptoms, as we know, include dyspnea, fatigue, fluid retention, really can be um, categorized by heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction where the heart muscle becomes weak and enlarged, the EF is less than 40%, and heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure where that heart muscle is stiff, it's not able to relax normally, there's more of a problem with the filling, um, but in this case the ejection fraction remains within the normal range above 50%. Causes coronary artery disease, hypertension. Um, studies suggest that long-term blood pressure control can actually reduce the risk of heart failure by about 50%. Uh, valvular disorders, the aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation that Dr. Phelan was just talking about. Arrhythmias, you know, tachyarrhythmias, which a lot of times if treated can be a reversible cause of heart failure. High PVC burden. Um, also, patients that have a pacemaker that are getting a lot of RV pacing can cause them to have difficulties with heart failure. Toxic substances, um, most common of which being alcohol, certainly cocaine, um, certain chemotherapy agents, including adramycin. Um, infection, certain viruses can affect the heart, as well as uh, myocarditis, um, chagas disease, a leading cause of heart failure worldwide, not obviously so common here in the United States, as well as inflammatory conditions, uh, hemochromatosis, amyloid, uh, sarcoid, <coughs> as well as our inherited cardiomyopathies, some of the dilated cardiomyopathies or hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. I just briefly want to review some of the neurohormonal mechanisms and compensatory mechanisms of heart failure, just because it really um, is what we guide our treatment on. Um, basically, any impairment of that left ventricle that leads to a decreased cardiac output activates uh, neurohormonal compensatory mechanisms, basically aimed at improving that mechanical environment of the heart. We get that activation of the sympathetic nervous system, where we see the rise in heart rate, the increased myocardial contractility, the peripheral vascular vasoconstriction. Obviously, we're using the beta blockers to kind of help block that response, as well as that renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. 
you know, the angiotensin causes that basal constriction, increased blood volume, retention of the salt and water from the aldosterone. If left untreated, those high concentrations of vasopressin and the natriuretic peptides can cause progressive cardiac dilation, cardiac remodeling, which is going to lead to further heart failure. This slide is just illustrating um, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association's stages of heart failure. Uh, it's really emphasizing the development and the progression of disease, and it's used to describe both individuals and populations. It helps to recognize both the risk factors as well as the abnormalities of cardiac structure that are associated with heart failure. The stages are progressive. Once you've moved forward, there's no going back. And we know that further progression along the cycle is going to decrease our five-year survival rate. So stage A really is patients that are just at high risk of heart failure um, but do not have structural heart disease. So our hypertension, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. Really, here we just want to be enforcing that heart-healthy lifestyle, prevent um, per vascular disease, prevent some of those left ventricular structural abnormalities. Stage B is patients that have structural heart disease but have not ever had symptoms of heart failure. So these are patients that have had a previous myocardial infarction, people that have evidence of left ventricular remodeling or have a low ejection correction, patients that have asymptomatic valvular heart disease. Here our goals are really to prevent heart failure symptoms from occurring, um, prevent further cardiac remodeling. So these are patients where we might be using an ACE inhibitor or ARB, a beta blocker to have coronary disease. Of course, taking care of the underlying issue, revascularization or valve surgery if appropriate. Stage C is what we'll spend most of um, this presentation talking about. People that have structural disease and have had either current or prior symptoms of heart failure. So here our goals are going to be more to control symptoms, improve quality of life, help to reduce hospitalizations, and prevent mortality. And then further along that continuum is stage D heart failure. So those that have refractory heart failure, they're having marked heart failure symptoms or symptoms even at rest people that are coming back into the hospital despite being on guideline-directed medical therapy. These people, again, we want to control their symptoms and help improve their quality of life, try to reduce hospital admissions, but here we need to think about what's next. Um, is this a patient that would be a candidate for advanced heart failure options, either a transplant or mechanical circulatory support with a VAD, or if it's someone that we should be talking more about palliative care or hospice? I also just want to compare um, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association classifications of heart failure with those New York Heart Association functional classifications. So as you know, the, the New York Heart Association functional classes focus more on exercise capacity and symptoms. It really gauges the severity of symptoms in those that have structural heart disease, particularly those that are in stage C or D. Um, it is subjective by the clinician, and we know that their functional classification can change rapidly over time. But we do know that the functional classification is an independent predictor of their mortality, and it also helps us to determine which treatment options they're eligible for. Moving on to the, the treatment of heart failure, um, this is from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association 2013 heart failure guidelines. So these are for uh, recommendations for treatment of stage B heart failure. Really, as you can see, basically we're trying to prevent progression on stage C, you know, prevent symptomatic heart failure from occurring and help to decrease mortality. So, these are you know, patients that have had a myocardial infarction or have a reduced EF. They should be treated with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. Certainly, if they've had an MI, they should be on a statin. 
we know the importance of controlling their blood pressure. These are class one level eight indications. Um, and also uh, patients that have a low ejection fraction, we know that some of the calcium channel blockers can actually be harmful um, in this patient population. <laughs> now moving on to stage C, heart failure. Um, patient education is of course recommended for both systolic and diastolic heart failure. Again, the class one recommendation um, to educate people on the importance of weighing themselves daily. Some limitation of dietary sodium intake, the research on this really varies. Um, we know for stage A and stage B, heart failure is recommended to stay under 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Stage C and D, the research really varies. Um, in general, we say some limitation of sodium is recommended. Certainly, we know that if they're having large amounts of salt, they're not going to respond to their diuretics as well. Um, the ability for patients to recognize their symptoms and to, to call if they need help. Um, the ability to manage their medications. The importance of exercise. Um, in the last couple of years, Medicare now covers cardiac rehab for people that have systolic heart failure. Um, they have to have an EF of less than or equal to 35%, um, and they have to have been on medical therapy for at least six weeks. Also, of course, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, and the importance of treating comorbidities, making sure they're wearing that CPAP, making sure they're controlling their blood sugars, um, their blood pressure, things like that. Um, this is just a nice flow diagram, again, from the heart failure guidelines that goes over a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, stage C, um, any of the New York Heart Association classifications. So it is a class 1A recommendation for these patients to be on an ACE inhibitor or ARB and a beta blocker. Moving on from that over to the left, you'll see for patients um, that are volume overloaded, uh, class 1 uh, indication for a loop diuretic. For patients that are persistently symptomatic and self-identify as an African-American, uh, hydralazine and nitrate are beneficial in reducing their morbidity and mortality. And this is new for the 2013 guidelines. Um, it, for patients that have class 2 to 4 heart failure, as long as their GFR is greater than 30, their potassium is under 5, it's now a class 1 level A recommendation for an aldosterone antagonist. ACE inhibitors, again, um, it's recommended for patients that have had current or prior symptoms of heart failure unless contraindicated. We know this helps to reduce their morbidity and mortality. Um, it's going to help to reduce their cardiac afterload, increase their cardiac output, also helps to suppress the growth of the myocyte, prevents pathological thickening of that ventricular wall. There's really not been any difference shown among the various ACE inhibitors on the effects of symptoms or survival. In general, we say we should attempt to use doses that have been shown to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events in clinical trials. So that would be on average of an allopril around 16 milligrams a day, lisinopril 32 to 35 milligrams per day. Of course, with using these medications, we need to closely monitor their renal function and their electrolytes. They should be assessed within one to two weeks after initiated initiation of therapy and periodically thereafter. Angiotensin receptor blockers, again, a class one level A recommendation for patients with a reduced EF if they are ACE intolerant and less contraindicated to reduce morbidity and mortality. It's a level two A recommendation, so it's reasonable to reduce morbidity and mortality as an alternative to ACE if they've already been on an angiotensin receptor blocker for another reason. Um, but it is important to remember ACE inhibitors are still our first line of therapy um, when being used for heart failure. The beta blockers, when we're talking about heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, there's really three beta blockers that have been shown to be superior in clinical trials. 
It's carvedilol, isoprolol, and metoprolol succinate. Again, it's a class one level A recommendation um, to re for patients that have current or prior symptoms to reduce morbidity and mortality. Um, basically, here we're inhibiting those adverse effects from the sympathetic nervous, nervous system, that vasoconstriction, the rise in heart rate. We know that long-term treatment with beta blockers can help to lessen the symptoms of heart failure, can help to improve that left ventricular ejection fraction, increase exercise tolerance, and enhance the patient's overall sense of well-being. It's also important to note that there is a dose-dependent relationship. We do want to higher doses of these medications, we see more improvement in their LV function. The carvedilol, we try to titrate up to 25 milligrams EID. If they're over 200 pounds or 85 kilograms, we say trying to get up to 50 milligrams twice a day. I don't see many patients in practice that really tolerate that, but uh, it is recommended. And then metoprolol, um, working up to about 200 milligrams a day. Um, the aldosterone antagonist, so again, spironolactone, a clarinone. Uh, again, this was new from the 2009 guidelines to the 2013 guidelines. It's now a class one level A recommendation for patients that have class two to four heart failure and have an EF of less than 35% to reduce their morbidity and mortality. People that have class two heart failure should have a history of either prior cardiovascular hospitalization or an elevated BNP to be considered for this medication. Very important that their creatinine should be 2.5% less in men or 2.04 less in women, a GFR of more than 30 milliliters per minute, and their potassium level of less than five, or you do have the potential of causing harm um, in these patients. Uh, also, it's a level 1B recommendation to reduce morbidity and mortality following a acute MI in patients that have an EF of 40% or less who develop symptoms of heart failure or have a history of diabetes unless contraindicated. Diuretics, again, class 1 recommendation to help reduce the evidence of fluid retention. We know that diuretics themselves um, the effects on the morbidity and mortality are unknown. In general, we try to use the lowest dose possible to control their symptoms. Loop diuretics are generally preferred in most patients with heart failure. Usually we start on furosemide, um, but Umex and torsemide do have better bioavailability if they're not really absorbing that furosemide. Also, thiazide diuretics can be considered in hypertensive patients that have heart failure and evidence of mild fluid retention. We also sometimes use the thiazide diuretics for that sequential nephron blockade. Um, but when using that, it's really important to keep a close eye on both the electrolytes as well as the renal function. In patients that have lost 10 pounds overnight with one dose of metolazone added to their loop diuretic. Um, Hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate are also a class one recommendation for patients that are self-described as African-American and have class three to four heart failure with a reduced EF. It's important to note that they should already be on optimal doses of their ACE inhibitor and their beta blocker. Um, but the presumed benefit of the hydralazine and the isosorbide is increased um, nitric oxide bioavailability. Also, it's a class 2A recommendation, so it can be useful to reduce morbidity and mortality in patients that have um, reduced EF but can't use an ACE inhibitor or an ARB due to their kidney function or drug intolerance. Um, this is just a quick slide just kind of showing um, the magnitude of benefits for our various drugs in randomized clinical trials. Um, you can see significant reductions in mortality ranging from 17 to 34 percent with our guideline directed medical therapy, as well as significant reductions in heart failure hospitalizations ranging from 30 to, to 41 percent. 
A note about the Jackson is a class two rec two A recommendation. It can be beneficial in patients that have a reduced EF to help decrease hospitalizations for heart failure. So we know it really had no effect on mortality. It modestly reduced the risk of death and hospitalization. Um, it can help to improve symptoms and exercise tolerance. Usually seems most beneficial in patients that have more low output heart failure. Also, when using digoxin for heart failure, we target a, a lower therapeutic range, 0 0.5 to 0 0.9, um, and we do, and in general, you do not need to lower these patients with with digoxin. Uh, calcium channel blockers, it's class three recommendation that these medications can actually cause harm in patients that have heart failure with a reduced EF. Also of note, of course, we want to avoid NSAIDs, you know, the Actos, Avandia, and certain antiarrhythmics. Um, when thinking about atrial fibrillation, uh, amiodarone and ticosin are actually the only safe antiarrhythmics in people that have heart failure. Um, this is just a nice um, table. I won't spend much time on it. This is table 19 from the heart failure guidelines, but it basically goes over all of those uh, recommendations, gives you the level of evidence. Um, the strength of the recommendation all on one page. Now moving over to heart failure with a preserved EF. You can see the recommendations are much shorter. Uh, they can be summarized on this one slide. Basically, the treatment for heart failure with a preserved EF are, is directed towards um, the associated conditions as well as symptom magic management. So basically we know we need to improve their blood pressure, use diuretics to help get rid of that fluid retention, take care of any reversible fac factors, manage their AFib. Um, of, of note, most of the patients, you know, when we're talking about heart failure with a reduced EF, all of the treatments that help to reduce mortality basically are helping to reverse some of that left ventricular dilation. So it makes sense that you know patients that have heart failure with a preserved EF, they, they have little or no left ventricular dilation. So we don't see the same clinical benefits with the ACE inhibitors or, or the beta blockers. This slide is kind of busy. This is just going over the device therapy for management of heart failure. Um, to kind of summarize it, we know that people have a, that have a reduced ejection fraction are at six to nine times um, higher risk for sudden cardiac death than the general population. So an ICD is recommended in people that have an EF of less than 35%, have class two to three symptoms, are already on guideline directed medical therapy for their heart failure, and have an expectation of meaningful survival for more than a year. We also have, have cardiac resynchronization therapy. This is indicated for people that have evidence of ventricular dyssynchrony, so a QR restoration of 120 milliseconds or more. Um, also, that have an EF of less than 35%. And the results from that can be really remarkable. I've seen people go from an EF of 10% to 50% after implantation of their device. Switching gears, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the new technology that we have available for heart failure. Uh, the CardioMEMS device is an implantable pulmonary artery pressure monitor. Uh, the indications are very broad. It could be used in any patient that's had class 3 heart failure that's been hospitalized for heart failure within the last year. Contraindications, basically anyone that would not be able to be on dual antiplatelets or anticoagulants for one month post-implant. The CardioMEMS is a, it's about the size of a paper clip. You can see it on the, the left here. Um, and it's implanted through a right heart cath. It's an outpatient procedure. The patients go home the same day. Um, but it's implanted into one of the distal pulmonary arteries. It measures the patient's systolic, diastolic, and mean pulmonary artery pressures. And the rationale behind it is we see those pressure rises before patients start noticing the weight change or some of the symptoms of heart failure. 
So the patient goes home with a pillow. They lay on this pillow each day and press a button. It takes about 18 seconds for them to send through a reading. And it allows us to see their pressure readings and adjust their medications. We get the information by a website and can help to guide their medication management for their heart failure. It was approved based on the CHAMPION trial, uh, which was a randomized trial that had 550 patients. Um, they implanted all of the patients with the pulmonary artery pressure monitor and randomized them to either usual care or where the clinicians adjusted their medications based on their pulmonary artery pressure readings. They followed the patients for an average of 15 months. And what was noted was a 28% reduction in heart failure related hospitalizations after six months and a 37% reduction after 15 months. Um, <coughs> patients also had a trend towards improved mortality, a trend towards improved Minnesota living with heart failure quality of life scores as well. And just briefly in my last couple minutes, I wanted to discuss the the new medications that are out on the market for heart failure. Um, the first is Entresto, uh, which is a combination medication. It has valsartan, an uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, as well as a new medication called LCZ696, which is an acrylicin inhibitor. Basically, the inhibition of the acrylicin causes vasodilation. And this medication was approved by the Paradigm trial, which enrolled 8,400 patients. They treated patients with this medication, and they were found to have a 20% decrease in risk of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization than those that were treated with enalapril. Um, the medication, you know, contraindications would be the same as ACE inhibitors. It's available in DID dosing. Uh, there does need to be a period of washout uh, if the patient has been on an ACE inhibitor. And the adverse reactions, again, the side effect profile is very similar to what you would see with inhibitors. The other medication that's on the market now is um, Orlinor. This is basically a medication to help us lower the patient's heart rate. So it's indicated for people that have heart failure with a reduced EF that are in sinus rhythm, that have a resting heart rate of equal or greater than 70 beats per minute, and are already on maximally <coughs> tolerated dose of their beta blocker, or have a contraindication to a beta blocker. So this medication basically selectively inhibits the pacemaker IF or funny channel. It can decrease the heart rate by direct sinus node inhibition, basically prolongs the slow depolar depolarization phase. It was approved based on the SHIFT trial, which had uh, 6, 000, around 6,500 patients, where it demonstrated an 18% reduction in the relative risk of hospitalization for worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death. Also demonstrated a 26% reduction in relative risk of hospitalization for worsening heart failure. I think one of the most important points actually that the SHIFT trial showed us is that it's very important in patients with heart failure to get good control of their heart rate. Basically what they did with this medication was just try to get a decreased heart rate by about another 10 to 15 points. They target with the dosing on this medication, you basically target to keep their heart rate between 50 and 60 beats per minute. Uh, and again, that was shown to have um, better outcomes than um, patients that were just treated with a beta blocker. Uh, it is important to note that beta blockers do have a proven mortality benefit, so they should, of course, be up titrated first before considering the use of Corlinor. And certainly, uh, a factor in these new medications is being new on the market. They're both very expensive, around $375 a month for both of these new medications. So, so that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.